Apalachicola, Florida is the destination for the next episode of Painting and Travel. Sarah explores the town and its history as Roger sets up his easel and paints an historic fishing vessel. Today, Sarah and I are in Apalachicola. It's on the west coast of Florida. This is sometimes called the Forgotten Coast. Apalachicola has a population of about 2,000, maybe less, but it's a great place for artists to come, or if you just want to come to relax for a week, there's some beautiful bed and breakfasts here. A nice town, you won't be disturbed. It's a fun place to be. Lots of subject matter for artists. I'm by the waterfront now and I've chosen to paint this old boat. I think it's an old fishing boat of some sort. I think it's Greek. I'm not sure of the history of it, but this is what my subject is going to be. It's pretty much history, <laughs> to say the least, pretty much falling apart, but it has a lot of beautiful shapes, a lot of beautiful textures, and I like it a lot. So I'm going to do a painting of this. Yesterday when I saw this, I took an eight by 10 inch masonite board and I did this small painting. I very seldom do two paintings of the same subject like this, but I thought it would make a great demonstration. So I'm going to do the same painting today, only a little bit larger. This is 11 by 14 inch masonite covered with gesso and I primed it with some burnt sienna acrylic paint. So this is totally dry. I'm going to start off by drawing this with charcoal. So I'm going to do as accurate a drawing as I can which will save me a lot of time in the long run. I could do this with a brush, but if I have trouble here or I want to change the composition a little bit, this charcoal wipes off very easily and I won't have any paint to deal with to wipe off. Also, another advantage of using charcoal here is if I used paint to sketch this in, uh, then I would sort of destroy this nice burnt sienna tone underneath and I want to leave that intact for as long as I can because some of this burnt sienna may become or most likely will become part of the texture of this boat. I need the big basic shapes here to be proportionally right. I don't need to put in all the details. Now, this boat is listing a little bit to the right so I have to keep that in mind so that means this line here will be slanting down and so will the stern, slanting a little bit that way. And whenever I paint a boat like this, I think of a figure eight. And no matter what angle I'm looking at this boat, a figure eight will usually work for me to get the nice proportions of the boat. In this case, I'm looking at it, of course, from the stern, but this figure eight will go something like this. We'll start here at the bow, swing around, the figure eight here, so you can see if we could see the other side of that boat, we would have a figure eight. Of course, we can't see this part of it or too much of that. So we'll just erase that. But I wanted to show you how I managed to get what I think are the right proportions. We've got a telephone pole in the background. Normally I would leave that out, but uh, I kind of like all this other stuff in the painting. We've got some trees back here. Looks like some beautiful cedar trees, maybe. I'm sort of using this eight by 10 inch painting as a guide. So I'm pretty much trying to stay with the same composition since that one worked out fairly well. Back here, we have other shrimp boats. So I'm going to put those in as well. There's a brick building on my right. And this is an art center now. And we'll put just the edge of that in here. And I like this picket fence. I won't worry too much about the picket fence because as I paint this background in here, all this is gonna disappear. So I'm just putting a little indication in 
right now, just so I know approximately where it's gonna go. Now one important thing is to establish my lights and darks in a painting. So as I look at this, we have a very dark side of the boat right under here. And also this building is dark and this casts a shadow across here. So all this is gonna be very dark. Earlier it was overcast and it would have been great for painting because I wouldn't have to stand in the sun, but now the bright sunlight is out and it does make some, for some nice, beautiful white patches on this boat up here. So in a way, I'm glad the sun did come out. I started to put some white paint out on my canvas, but since this is acrylic, it dries very quick. So I didn't put all my paints out at once. In fact, that's drying. It's only been out there a few minutes. It's drying. Let me get rid of that and we'll start over fresh. I'm starting out with three primary colors. It's very basic, simple palette. I've got titanium white, ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, alizarin crimson. In a little while, I'm going to add some yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and some cadmium red light. And that cadmium red light will be for just a little bit of this hull right down here to use some bright red as an accent color. Well, I'm all set up here, I'm ready to paint, but this may be a good time to take a little break and join Sarah and learn a little bit more about this fascinating town called Apalachicola. Dolores Rue is kind enough to take a few minutes out from her busy day to talk to us. Now, she's a local business owner and has grown up here in Apalachicola. Her dad built and owned a seafood business and uh, was uh, involved in that for several decades. Uh, over 50 years. And every time we come through here, we feel a nice homey aspect because of traveling around Florida, so many towns have changed and lost their flavor. But here, when we come to Apalachicola, the heart of it still seems to be alive. And when you look downtown, and I'll show you an old photograph, when you look downtown, you can still recognize the buildings. They're still the same facades as 100 years ago. Well, in 1900, May 25th, 1900, we had a fire. And it burned three blocks and all the way to the water. So all of these buildings were built right around 19, one, two, three and they're still the same buildings. It's always fun for us to come through Apalachicola, and I've noticed a lot of tourists here that um, just seem to come for a few days and relax because it's just a laid back feeling. And someone told me that um, country music stars from Nashville like to come down here because it's just a We have had casual. quite a few. Mm -hmm. In fact, when my husband was in the charter fishing business, uh, Barbara Mandrell came and went fishing with him, uh, Tanya uh, Tucker came and went fishing with him, but now we never told anybody who they were, so they had their privacy. Well, that would mean a lot, so that's why this, uh, another uh, special thing about this town, that people can keep quiet about the uh, famous true. people and that visit. You would not recognize these people on the street. They didn't look anything like they look on stage. Because they've got their fishing hat on and just mm -hmm. low-keyed. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I think a lot of Floridians like to visit Apalachicola too because of it having the flavor of old Florida still. Uh, we have quite a few visitors from down south that come up here because they want to get away from the rat race. And they live there and they know what it's like, but this has always been called the other Florida. And not only that, we have an elegance that other people are looking for. You do have an elegance here, and I've noticed it around town, and the beautiful older homes, some of the bed and breakfast, the inn. They have been restored, and uh, they're some of the grandest houses in Florida. Dolores, um, the weather is so nice here. I know that they often have a plein air paint out. Is that once or twice a year? Usually about twice a year. And we'll have as many as uh, 50 or 60 artists that come. They'll set up all over the streets and paint for two or three days. Well, there would be a variety of scenes. You'd have marshes, Very much so. the and, river. Uh, they're good for business. They eat out most of the time. They stay in hotels and 
uh, bed breakfasts and what have you. So it's a very good tourist industry. Yes, and I guess they can really appreciate the beautiful surroundings. Okay, I'm back, and uh, here's another thing I forgot to mention. This is very important for me to bring with me all the time. That's a small atomizer that keeps my paints wet. Not that you can keep acrylic paints wet for very long in this hot sun, but it does help. I'm going to start with my dark colors, my dark values. Although I could, in this case, start with a lighter sky, but I think, as a general rule, I like to start with the dark values first. One nice thing about using so few colors, I don't have all these choices to contend with. I only have three colors. Usually I can mix what I need with these three colors. I want the bottom of this boat to just disappear into these shadows. So the bottom of the boat and the shadow will be just one big area of color or value, one large shape. This is a brick building. So even though it's in shadow, the local color is a brick red, of course but it's gonna have a lot of blue influence of it because the sky, of course, is shining its light on this side of the building. This, it's not getting any sunlight, so any light I'm getting from the side of this building is from the sky. It's blue, so there's gonna be a blue influence on this wall. So a combination of this blue and red should do just fine. There's a lot of influences of color going on everywhere. There's green plants growing down here with little white flowers on them. So those green plants are going to affect the color of the wall. So there may be some more, maybe a little bit of a green effect going on down here as opposed to up here where the effect of this green is not reaching the top. But down here, we'll put a little bit of yellow in here. And what that will do is it will also tie in and create some harmony between these weeds with the flowers and the wall. I'll tie it all together. These are just very rough, big brush strokes. I'm not trying to get any detail in at the moment. Just the big, big areas. And I'm getting some of those big shapes in. Right back over here, they, there's a lot of shrimp boats and they repair them back here. So we may hear a little bit of noise from this town. We're right really in the heart of the historic district here. So there is a lot of activity going on. There's the lower part of that transom. I think I'll use the same color that I have here. And even though it's lighter on this side, I'm going to use the same color, only I make it a little thinner. Just put this on as a wash and let that burnt sienna glow through. Here, see, I can build this up a little bit at a time. And since I have this burnt sienna background, I'll just put this on as a wash and keep establishing these big, broad areas that I want to get down first. From there, I can work into the smaller details. This is that red transom, bottom of it down here. Well, there's a lot of crows. I don't know where all these crows have come from today. Earlier, I saw maybe a hundred of them over there by the shrimp boats. The telephone pole is very green. I think it's from the chemical they put on the wood to preserve it. See this? We haven't been here for more than just a few minutes. That's totally dry. Now, as things go back in the distance, of course, there's more atmosphere between me and whatever it is in the distance. So those cedar trees over there, even though they're not very far away, they are in the distance. So I want to push those back a little bit. So instead of using some pure color, I'll put a little bit of white in them because as things go back in the distance, things lose their color and they lose their contrast. So I won't make those as strong in, in value or in color as I will the things closer up. As I work on these paintings, it's a continual job of adjusting my values and adjusting my colors. But I'm most concerned with the values rather than the colors. If the values are, are good, then the colors are, are secondary in importance. I like to use as big a brush as I can, actually, to, to do these paintings. I don't want to overkill. I don't want a two-inch paintbrush here. But 
the bigger the brush I use, the quicker I can get these big areas down and the big shapes. And it's easier to get the big shapes with a bigger brush. If I had a small brush, I'd be tempted to start putting in the detail. I don't want to do that, not yet. It seems like all the butterflies have arrived in town in the last couple of days too. Okay, I have my dark areas down. I have some of my middle tones in. Now I'll put my light areas. I'm using my ultramarine blue and white. So I may dip into my other two colors just to offset that ultramarine blue look. Here we go, we'll put in that sky. I wanna use a lot of paint while I'm putting this sky in. So I won't have to go back a second time and cover it again. The trick to doing a sky in acrylics is to get it down fast because it does dry so very rapidly that it's very difficult to blend anything, especially out here in, in the sun because this is gonna be dry in just no time at all. Now down here towards the horizon, it's gonna be a little bit warmer in color than up towards the zenith. As I look up, it's a really dark blue sky. As I look down, it gets warmer and lighter. So down here towards the bottom, I'll put in some yellow to warm this up and make it lighter. I think I'm going to try and keep it as bold as I can with these brush strokes. There are a few clouds out there. I'm not sure I need them, although they might be fun to add one or two of them. Now the thing about clouds, it's a principle that as things go back in the distance, they get cooler, but clouds are an exception. If the cloud is closer to you, it's, it's of course white. We call it a white cloud, but as it moves in the distance, it gets warmer and a little bit more yellow. And if I have a, a pure white cloud in the background, it will come forward. To push that cloud back, I make it warmer. So that's an exception to a rule about warm colors coming forward and cool colors receding. So I always make these clouds in the distance somewhat warmer. Well, this has a good pattern going now. So now I can start with more of the detail. I consider this a big shape now. What I want to do is start to define the smaller shapes within this big shape without losing the big shape. An advantage of using acrylics is that they dry fast, and when they are dry, I can put a glaze over it. I really haven't used hardly any white on this boat yet. A little bit back here. The rest of this is all transparent colors. I think I'll start with some white and mix it with some of these transparent colors. And I think maybe now it's a good time to put out that yellow ochre and burnt sienna. There was really no point in putting them out too much earlier because they just would have been dry. The yellow ochre is actually pretty close to the Indian yellow, especially in value, but the Indian yellow is transparent. The yellow ochre is uh, opaque. I'm giving myself the opportunity to interpret what I see here. I'm not trying to copy it exactly. Wow, this almost reminds me of a patchwork quilt. There's just so many rich, interesting sections of this boat. Some ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. This plywood up here is very gray. It's just grayed from the weather, but I'm going to put, keep a little more color in it than what I see up there. Maybe I should work on this tree over here. So. I'll try and mix up a color. It will still be green and yet have a feeling that it's in the distance. Now that's too light of a, light a color. That tree is quite dark. So again, I have to keep adjusting my colors to where I think they're gonna be right. Now the edge of this tree is very important to keep this edge of this tree feeling like it's a nice soft edge. Down here, I'm going to make it cooler just to contrast with this red. Some white, ultramarine blue. I still have some that green on my brush, but I'll drop in a few negative areas here. With the edge of my brush, I'll add some more of that foliage. Now it really looks like the boat is planted firmly on the ground. Yellow ochre and some white. We'll put in some of these highlights right on the edge of the boat. We can grab my Kenyan red light 
on the bottom of that transom, we'll use some of that cadmium red for some accents. Oh, what a beautiful color this cadmium red is. Especially when looking at it amongst all these grayed down colors. I'll take that same color, and even though I don't see any of that red color up in here, I'll just put some in there, just for harmony's sake, to tie this together. Some pure alizarin crimson at the top here, and I'll tie these reds together. Now I think it's time for me to put in this fence. A little bit of sunlight is coming across this building now. It's gonna to start to cast some shadows across this fence. But I'm going to put in, part of this fence is being a white fence. I'm going to put in a little bit as, as the fence being in shadow. So I know shortly, a lot of that fence is going to be in shadow. Let me see, I'll use ultramarine blue, some burnt sienna. Because I want this cool color, but I don't want it terribly cool. I don't want it like a sky blue. So I'll mix up this sort of a cool gray piece of chalk I can sketch in approximately where the top of that and the bottom of that fence is going to be. Not all of them are exactly spaced and to give them a little bit of a skew here and there will just help to give them a little bit of character. And with a smaller brush I'll put these posts behind the fence. I think this fence might be too bright, the values may be a little too intense, too high, but it is the brightest thing I'm looking at. But I don't want my main focus to be on this fence, so I think I should cut these down. I'm going to let this dry a bit and put a wash over it. Well, way over the other side of the Apalachicola River in Apalachicola Bay, there's some more shoreline. It's where they do a lot of shrimping and oystering. Like 90% of the oysters in Florida come from the Apalachicola Bay Area. So we'll indicate some of the far distant shore. And with some blue here, we'll put in a hint of water there. I love the shrimp boats. I've painted many of them. I'm going to indicate a few of them in the back here with a small pointed brush. This is a brand new brush. So it's going to have a nice point on it. I'll take my my ruler, just with my hand, use this as a guide. Just a little suggestion. I don't want to describe them a whole lot. It's very often hard to finish a painting on location just because we're in the bright sun for one thing. I'll bring this back into the studio where we have some better conditions to work from. I have my painting I did yesterday, so I have a lot of color notes on not only that painting, but this painting. I've taken photographs and I'll show you what steps it takes to complete this. Well, I'm back here in my studio and I have the painting I started out on the field, along with this sketch I did the day before. Actually comparing the two, in many ways I like this smaller sketch. So I'm going to take bits and pieces from this smaller sketch, and I'm also going to work from my photograph here to my right on my laptop computer. So between those two references, I think I can finish this up rather quickly. So I'll get started. Cerulean blue, white, touch of ultramarine blue, and a hint of yellow ochre to keep that a nice warm color for the sky and clouds. I might leave that sky alone, but since I need that telephone pole a little thinner, that means I have to cover this sky again. I'll put this transformer in here. That way the viewer will know that this is not part of this boat of some kind of a mast or something. A few shadows right under here. I really like this fence here in the painting, but it's kind of rough right now. I'm going to work on that, put in more detail, and refine it. Well, that helps the fence quite a bit. I'll work on it more, put maybe some cool colors down in here. But right now, I'm going to jump over to the transom, to the stern here, and make this much brighter. It was very dull in real life, but I think some bright reds might make the painting interesting. Mix some warm color with burnt sienna, yellow ochre. I'll spray my board so the paint flows on easily. And we'll make this 
contrast right back on the stern, much more pronounced. Right back here is where all the working shrimp boats tie up. I'm going to put in more detail here. I want it kind of subtle. I don't want it to jump too much forward, but I do want some more rigging and some more description in that area. I'm going to keep this rather soft and gray in color. Then I'll put the back end of the cabin right here. That will describe this shrimp boat. I think by putting in these few details in this cabin down here, we'll be able to identify this as another shrimp boat. Then I'll put a few more details on this transformer and I'll load my brush up. This is a nice pointed brush, fairly new brush, so it has a good point on it. And I'll put a few electrical wires or telephone wires right in here. So I'll just do that a few times and then just commit like that. Well, I think that should finish this particular painting. And Apalachicola is a great place to visit along with the nearby towns of East Point, St. George Island, and Caravel. Lots of subject matter there. Well, I'm going to finish this just by signing it, and then we'll take one last final look. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.